Um, as I said in the first sermon, because uh, I have the joy of doing this for you guys as well, nobody fell asleep the first time, that's excellent. Um, the topic we're, ta- we're going to cover today is a big topic, and Michael had two verses and took two weeks to preach on them. Uh, Eric had two verses and reckoned he needed a week or two. I reckon I need a month or a year for this one, but I'm going to try and keep it short. Uh, The sermon is in three pieces. We look at the head, the study of the text before us, the heart, how we feel about it, and our hands, the application, how we apply it. Um, And that application is probably the most important thing because what's the old saying? Faith without works is dead. We need to apply. But it's a tough topic too. Uh, If you get angry at something I say, hold off until the end and then come and talk to me. Um, Let's pray. Father, you love us. You're passionate about us. You care for us. Teach us truth that we might know and love you more passionately, that we might love the world and that we might love each other in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the head. What is the text trying to tell us? If I go back two places, you know the text. It's been before you. And in this piece of text, uh, we were told that, uh, Michael told us that it's, it's very literary, it's written in fine Greek, it's a fancy piece of writing. Um, it was written by an educated person. And this person has used literary devices uh, drawn from oratory and from Hebrew writing tradition and Greek writing traditions to put this piece of writing together. And some of these things include rhythm and poetic structures and linked thought. Um, And if we fail to see the literary methods they use, we're probably going to fail to see some of the meaning of the passage. And I know this sounds like uh, some of you have been to seminary, I mean seminary before. Or it might be, oh, heck, we're back in English with Mrs. Bloggs again. I'll try and keep it a bit lighter than that, okay? But if you don't understand the literary type that you're looking at, you mistake fairy tales for history, for instance, okay? Or poetry for inspirational speeches. Now, this is how we normally read this passage. And in, in fact, in our Bible, it doesn't even split out these verses into a separate little chunk of its own. It's, it's mixed in with everything else. And w- uh, we see it as a block of text, just like a textbook or a history book. And, and then the chapter and the uh, passage divisions, they, they make it worse, wanting us to split it up even worse. But if we reformat the text in front of us, we see something different. There's a rhythm to it. And the rhythm is that you have a thought, A, a sub-thought B, and then you come back to the thought A again. And so it does this three times, ABA, 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 right? Thought, sub-thought, thought. And if we drop out the sub-thoughts, we see this. In this you greatly rejoice, you have been grieved by many trials, or various trials, or sufferings is another word, that the genuineness of your faith may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, Whom having not seen you love, receiving the end or the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The meaning is much clearer if we drop out the sub-thoughts. It's also disturbing. In this you greatly rejoice, you have been grieved by various trials, or you have struggled under suffering. Peter is telling the believers they are going to suffer. Why? that the genuineness of your faith may be found and praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ at the end times will happen because of this. And he you who have not seen, you love him and in the end you will receive the outcome of your faith which is salvation. As a side thought, salvation isn't just about not going to hell. Salvation is part of that word self. What is a self? It's an ointment. It's a healing. And so salvation is more than just not going to hell. It's healing and putting us back together and making us whole and strong and better. 
And that faith in Jesus Christ that leads to salvation is the cause of the joy that we see in the first passage or first section up there. So what is the important thought that Peter's trying to get across? I know it's just like going back to seminary. He's using something called a chiasm or a chiasm. I don't speak Greek, so how to pronounce it's a whole different thing. And what it is, is that if you have an idea, and then you sandwich a different idea inside it, and then repeat that same idea, and then put the first idea at the back again, you kind of get an A, B, B, A type of idea. And if you read those ideas left to right, it looks like a cross, a chai or a kai or something, whatever it is in Greek. And it's a poetical device that's been used in Hebrew, liter- uh, Hebrew writing for many, many years, as it was in Greek and Latin. And it appears now. There's thoughts with sub-thoughts packaged in. Now, I've only picked up one word in our passage, but if we expand that passage slightly to include verse 5, oh, hang on, wait a minute, that's not part of the verses. That's the verse from last week. Yes, it is. But another literary device is that you use part of the previous verse as also the beginning of the next verse. And actually, um, as a spoiler alert, the last verse in our one is the beginning of next week, but I'm not going to talk about that because I will get in trouble with someone. But if we put this passage in, we see that he starts with salvation and ends with salvation. He's talking about last times or end times. He's packaging it and rejoicing, and he says, though now. If we were to summarize it, we would see that our salvation in the end times causes us to rejoice. But for now, we face trials and sufferings. For now, we do not see Jesus or God, but we will rejoice in the end when everything hangs together. In Western literature, the most important part of a a piece of writing is at the end, it's the climax, you know, and he slayed the dragon and they lived happily ever after. Or the conclusion, I've said all this stuff and I've come to a conclusion. Um, For the Hebrews, the most important part is found in the middle. This is the guts of what Peter wants to say to us. He says that you and your faith are as precious as gold. In fact, they are more precious than gold. And gold is tested by fire. It's put in a fire and the rubbish comes out and it's scooped out. And if he's comparing our faith to that, he's comparing us to having to go through the fires in difficult times. And he says, why? So it may be found and you will be given praise, honour and glory when Jesus is revealed. That there is a celebration that we've made it in the end times. You and your faith are precious, but you will be refined. There is also a beautiful bit normally just after the centre. Jesus, whom you have not seen, you love and rejoice over. So, how do we feel about this? Now, Michael told us that um, the early church suffered. And he listed the emperors who persecuted the church. And he told us that First Peter has many themes and that suffering is one of those themes. And that this is specifically being spoken to a church that's being persecuted. And these things are all true. So how do we feel about it? I'm going to say in the Western church, we do not care about this passage. It's meaningless to us. We aren't persecuted for our faith. We don't have to hold on for grim death. We come to church. We're comfortable. We don't have to hurt to keep our faith. And if I was a really brave preacher, I would stop right now, walk away and let you stew on it. Uh, But I'm not that brave, and Michael doesn't need that many complaints. How do we feel about this? We in the Western church care greatly about the subjects this passage raises. Because while it's directly related to being persecuted for Christ, its subject is suffering difficulties, trials. Suffering in the West is one of the greatest reasons people turn away from the faith. Where is God when I need him? Why doesn't God answer my prayers? Why is God silent? Why do these things happen? You know, it's just not fair. 
Suffering is one of the greatest reasons people hate and reject God. How can an almighty God allow suffering? If he's all-powerful and all-present and all-knowing and is suffering, he must really suck. God can't be real, or if he is, I don't want to follow a God like that. This passage speaks directly to the heart of this matter. And if we as a church don't understand this, we cannot communicate this to the outside world. And unfortunately we don't. Really well in the West. So he's saying, for a little while you're going to have suffering, you're going to have trials. And those troubles are going to grieve you. They will hurt You will suffer. That's not Peter. This is me telling you. You will suffer. And those sufferings will show what type of faith you have. And they will test you. We in the West are not good at seeing these types of passages. Take John 16.33. I've told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. We see it like this. I've told you these things so you may have peace. I have, take heart, I've overcome the world. And we miss out the suffering. Take our passage, we see it like this. We're missing a line. And why is that? On the whole, we do not understand suffering, either experientially or theologically. Not as a church. We in the West have been sold a bunch of lies. And those lies are the large cause of depression, loss of faith, hatred of God, and having a weak and effectual faith. We've come to see pleasure, ease, and entertainment as life's highest goals, and when we get smacked in the face by reality, we have no way of dealing with it. These lies are seen most clearly in a theology called triumphalism, or prosperity doctrine, or hyperfaith. We think that a life that God blesses looks like this. Large churches. Certainty. Miracle healings. Political influence. Easy fellowship. Food. If that's what a good God looks like, if that's what a God's blessing looks like, It's no wonder people are confused by there being so much suffering in the world. Jesus believes being blessed looks like this. Matthew's Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you. Great is your reward in heaven. God blesses you when you are hungry. You will be satisfied. And that word hunger is both physical hunger and used in terms of spiritual hunger. You can take it either way. Blessed are you when you weep now. For one day you will laugh. Our expectations are wrong. In the non-Western world, they believe life consists of suffering, pain and misery. And any moments of peace and happiness are a blessing to be received joyfully. On the other hand, we believe we are owed ease, happiness and prosperity and get bent out of shape when things aren't always roses. The early church thought more like non-Westerners than like we in the West are doing. Peter is comforting them. They know there's going to be pain and suffering, especially now they're Christians. Peter reminds them it's only for a short while, even if it's only a short lifetime. And he reminds them that God will keep them to the point that they will rejoice when they suffer because it reminds them of something. He is telling them the whole truth, the unvarnished truth, because the whole truth will set you free. We get told lies. We get told you shouldn't suffer because God wants to bless you. Hold on to the promises of God. Here's a promise from Jesus, who is God. In this world you have trouble. Don't know about you, that's a promise I can hang on because I do know it's true. Why did he say this? So that you might have peace, so that you're not surprised. And so that you know that there is one who is strong enough 
to break the power of hell and death and look after you in the midst of difficulties. Does it sound like the passage we're studying? God is protecting you by his power until you receive salvation. We get told that God will remove you from sufferings. He will heal you, he'll remove you, he'll do something. God is with us. He is amongst us. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, God was in the fire with them. He didn't remove them. Jesus in Gethsemane cried out to God, get me out of here, I can't take this, take it away from me. God sent an angel and was with him. Stephen, he got stoned. He saw heaven open and Jesus standing there. God was with them in all their trials. If we take a look at Psalm 23, going back to the old days, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, not yea, though I'm helicoptered out of the shadow of death. I will not fear. Why? God is with you. He prepares a table before me in the middle of my enemies. Why are they not afraid? Because his rod and his staff is with them. The staff is for leading. The rod is a weapon. It'll take out a bear or a wolf. So if we were to modernise it, we would say God is walking down the road with us with a rod on his shoulder. Or rod, for the older folk, used to mean a gun. So I think it might look a bit like this. Hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> Try me now. God doesn't remove us from the valley. He's there with us. He stands guard while we eat, keeping us safe in the midst of our enemies, in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our difficulties. We're also told that God will not let harm come to you, and this is controversial. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Promises like this are specific. They're not generic for everybody. They point to the character of God and the operating system of God, not to your specific situation. God spoke this to the people of Judah through the prophet Jeremiah. The king Zedekiah refused to listen. He and his leaders were taken before King Nebuchadnezzar. His sons were killed in front of him. He was blinded, taken to Babylon and was a slave. The people were removed from this, the places that they lived and they went into captivity. But God had a plan. God said he was going to prosper and not harm them. He did return them, but they went through some real struggles in the meantime. Hyperfaith, triumphalism and prosperity doctrine are based on fear. They give you false promises. They tell you that you will avoid suffering, that you will prosper and be healthy if you obey God. They predict what will happen because if you do this, this will happen. And they help you to understand God or to say that you can understand God. And as Michael has told us, our faith has to go from what we know to what we don't know. If we think we understand God and everything, we do not know God. God is bigger than us. They tell you that you can change the outcome by your actions. Hyperfaith hyper blames you for its failings. If you are suffering, you have not, uh, you've done something wrong. If you're poor, God has not blessed you, despite blessed are the poor. If you're sick, you've not prayed hard enough. If things go wrong, you didn't do enough spiritual warfare. If you have doubts, your faith is weak and God is disappointed. You won't get whatever it is you want. And the disciples believed similarly. They saw a man who'd been born blind from birth and said, Lord, was it him or his parents that sinned that caused this? And Jesus said, no. It was so the glory of God might be revealed and healed him. He healed him. He didn't heal everybody. You're not sick because, necessarily because you're cursed or you've done something wrong. Stuff happens to all of us. God does allow difficulty. And it's important to know that suffering is not evil. When God allows it, he's not doing evil. Suffering is just neutral. God doesn't plan us harm. But stuff that is difficult and hard, he does allow to happen to us. Look, I once took my son into town 
and I held him down kicking and screaming and allowed a man with a knife to cut him. True. Am I evil? At first glance, you might think so. But when I tell you that my son's finger was so badly infected that if the surgeon hadn't incised the wound and got rid of the pus, he would have died of blood poisoning, suddenly you see what I did in a whole different light. The act itself is not evil. My son had no idea of why that was happening, and I had no way to communicate what I was doing to him and why I was hurting him. Suffering and God are often like that. God doesn't tell us because we just can't understand. And we hate that we like to be in charge. Our original sin, Adam and Eve, we want the tree of knowledge so that we can be powerful like God. God doesn't plan us harm, but he does work with what happens and turns all things to the good of those who love him and are called according, which doesn't mean we don't have problems, he just turns them. So Peter says, be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a while. These trials show that your faith is genuine. Side thought, I love my wife. I think our marriage is genuine. I get tempted by pretty ladies, and if I followed them all around, I would say that my marriage is not very genuine. When I suffer by resisting, I show my marriage is genuine. I wish I had more time to talk about how I've experienced God's joy myself in times of suffering. My greatest understanding of God's love and faithfulness has been found through times of suffering. My greatest questions and ongoing heartache have come in times of real struggle. But God has kept me in the faith. Even when I let go, he kept me. God refuses to give answers, but ironically the fact that he won't answer me means he's more powerful and bigger, and I'm not in charge, which makes him more godlike, more trustworthy. He's not a wimpy human made up invention. This discussion is purely theory unless we see it in action. I would recommend these two books In God's Underground, Richard Rembrandt, 16 Years Tortured, saw the joy in the light of God. Vicar of Baghdad. Andrew White, Anglican Church, Baghdad. Everybody he's worked with has lost family. They've been killed or stolen. They don't know where they are. The church was bombed. He uh, baptised 13 adults in 2010, and they're mostly dead within a week. And he says, they live in hell, they're filled with joy. We mourn loss and tragedy, of course, but most of the time we're filled with joy. They literally see the light of God. There's photographs where the light of God is amongst them. And he says he's never been in a place with more love and joy. Personally, I had a bad accident five years ago. I fell three and a half metres onto concrete. And I smashed my leg so badly, 10 to 20 millimetres of bone disappeared. It was crushed. They filled me full of ketamine, dragged me off to hospital. And when I finally came out of my stoned stupor 10 hours later... Um, I had the strange idea that I should do a quiet time and thank God for the people that leave Bibles beside your desk. Uh, and thing. I felt I should read Psalm 51, which wasn't on my reading list, and I opened it up, and verse 8 says, Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou have crushed may rejoice. That's a pretty specific verse for waking up in that state. I was encouraged to receive comfort so quickly and so accurately doesn't always happen. And knowing God was involved and was really important in the days to come. As a, comp- accident of, as a consequence of that action, I have complex regional pain syndrome. I'm in pain every day. Sometimes I'm in pain all day. In the morning I get up and I either stand on a leg that feels like I've badly sprained or broken it, or on a really bad day I, I barely stand. It hurts to walk. It hurts to sit. Sometimes if you see me sweating, I'm in pain. And I thank God for my injury. I'm not nuts. I don't like pain. Uh, Sometimes I'm driven close to despair. There's been nights I've wanted to smash my head through the wall. But this injury has brought me close to God. It has stripped away my arrogance and my self-reliance. It has burned away stuff that is excess to my life and got me focused on what is important. 
And I now work with people who are in chronic pain or in psychiatric illness, and I'm better able to help them because I'm in the same pit of trouble that they're in. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, just as the sufferings of Christ flow into our lives, so his comfort overflows. With the comfort we've received, we can comfort others. I've told guys I'm thankful for my pain, and after they looked at me like I was nuts, I told them why, and they could take it. I could have a discussion about pain and difficulty in God because I am there with them. And in my pain and suffering, I've discovered a God who truly loves me. The noise of the world gets stripped away. I get truly honest with God. I've been forced to struggle. I've been through the fire. I've been refined. I'm still being refined because there's a lot of gunk inside me. My faith is not built on the lie. It will withstand the difficult times. And I am joyful because one day this will be finished. I get to go home. And I'm looking forward to that more now than I used to. First Peter is a love story about a God who loves us. Before the creation of the world, Christ was chosen to go to the cross. Before we were created, before sin, before the fall, before suffering, Christ was chosen. God himself chose to enter a period of suffering. Why? So that he could have a bride who is purified and refined and who loves him not because they're chasing his money but because they love him. And he doesn't stand there and watch us like judges on Britain's Got Talent. He suffers with us. He suffered with us. And for the joy set before him, hung there and suffered. And we the bride have not seen him, yet believing we rejoice with joy, like Peter says, waiting for the end result of our faith. The bridegroom standing there at the end, going, come on, come on, come on, and the bride hungry to be there with her bride. And we can trust him because he has walked where we walk and he's been through the fire with us. Now if I was a Pentecostal, I'd issue an altar call now, but we're Anglicans, we don't do those. There's people waiting here to pray during communion if you want to pray about something. Or Michael the vicar or the people's wardens or your youth leaders. If you're really desperate, talk to me. Um, know that God loves you in the toughest of times and even when he doesn't seem to be there. I'm going to close in prayer. Father, you love us and you know us. You know every hair on our head. You know our thoughts before we speak them. You knit us together when we're in our mother's wombs. You chose to enter suffering so you could choose us, the people you love, who you love because you choose to, and that have loved you because we have chosen to, and we've proven that in tough times. Help us when we struggle. Help us to see your hand in it. Help us to know that we cannot escape your love and that there is nothing that can tear us out of your love or turn you away from us. Help us to know that hope and that joy in the midst of trials. Thank you that you passionately love us enough to let us grow and do the hard yards even though it hurts. Help those who need help and strength. And may we too help those who need care and support. Help us to be humble enough to receive support if we need it. Thank you for the hope you have in us and in the love we share. Amen.